All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you for joining CAD Dimensions today for today's Lunch and Learn. I thought we would do something a little bit more fun and we're gonna try to design a pumpkin in SolidWorks. So we're gonna take a lot of, take a look at some skills that we learned in our advanced part class. So if you wanna learn more, please check out our training on our website. So what we're gonna do is let's go ahead and actually jump into SolidWorks. I also want to point out, though, that we do have a chat option in our in our lunch and learn today. So if you do have any questions as I go throughout, please feel free to go ahead and type them up in the chat. And at the end of the lunch and learn, I'll go through and answer any questions that anyone might have. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into SolidWorks. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So we're in SOLIDWORKS now, and what we're going to do is we're going to start with just our inch template. So I'll go ahead and select that. And before I start building our pumpkin up, I want to take a moment to talk about thinking about our design here. Because when you're creating something that's, whether it's geometric or organic in form, you want to take a moment to think about the steps that you would take to create it because the beauty of CAD design is that there's always more than one way to create something, right? Someone might do it a completely different way. So what you wanna do is just take a step back, think about how you could make this and think about what your design intent is. That way down the road, if you ever wanna change it, the changes you need to make will automatically propagate to all the features in your part or more than one so that you work smarter instead of harder. So in this case, we're building a pumpkin today, right? So what we want to think about is if you take a look at a pumpkin, it basically has multiple facets as it goes around. So what we're going to do today is we're going to build up one single facet or in pumpkin terminology, they're called ribs. We're going to build up one rib and then we're going to use a circular pattern to pattern it around. Then we'll wrap up by by using a, a sweep to create a nice stem at the top. And then I'll briefly go into configurations because what's nice is we can actually use configurations to create different size pumpkins. That way we can actually create like a pumpkin patch or a scene using the same part, just different versions of that same part file. So let's go ahead and first think about, well, what plane do we want to start sketching on? To start sketching, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use our top plane. So our top plane is kind of going to represent our table or our floor of where our pumpkin is going to sit. So if I go ahead and click on our top plane, we're going to start a new sketch here. The first thing I'm going to do to create our pumpkin is I'm going to create a central shaft, which kind of represents the center of our pumpkin and where our stem is going to come out of. So we'll start with a really simple sketch. We're just going to do a circular sketch on our top plane and we'll give it a basic dimension. So we'll make this, this circle here just a simple one inch and then we're going to extrude it upwards from our top plane. So this extrusion that we're creating right now is going to represent the height of our pumpkin. And we can make it whatever we want, but this dimension we're going to come back to because this is what we're going to tie our configuration to, which is going to control the different heights of different pumpkin sizes we can make. So this first pumpkin we're going to make, let's make it 15 inches tall. So extrude it upwards. Once we have that, we have a single solid body and we're going to now create a couple more reference geometry so that we can go in and create a single facet of our pumpkin. So to create a new reference sketch, we're actually going to do this again on our top plane. So we'll start a new sketch and I want to determine now how many facets or ribs my pumpkin is going to have. So to do this, we're actually going to use our polygon tool. So on our sketch tab, I'll select my polygon tool and I'm going to create a polygon with the number of sides equal to the number of ribs on my pumpkin. 
So I want my pumpkin in this case to have 12 ribs. So we'll sketch our polygon, again, coming out from that center point. And the size right now doesn't really matter because this isn't determining the size of our pumpkin. It's just determining how many facets it has. So we'll sketch it out something like this. And then because it is good, um, good design to go ahead and make sure you do fully define the sketch, let's dimension this out. Like I said, the actual size of this doesn't really matter, but I do want to fully define it. And I am going to take this point at the top, hit control on my keyboard to multi-select and select the center point. I am going to add a vertical relation. This way my polygon cannot spin. So once I created this, you can see now that each one of these flats is going to represent where one of our facets would be. So again, this is just reference geometry. So let's go ahead and exit our sketch. So now what I wanna do is I wanna create my profiles for one of my ribs for my pumpkin. But before I do that, what I wanna do is I actually wanna create a reference plane. We are going to use our right plane. So what I'm gonna do is just select it. We'll click show so we can see it easily. And then I also want to create another, another reference plane that comes out from this point here and is coincident with the center of my part. So to create a reference plane, we can go to Features, Reference Planes, and click on Plane. Then what we'll do is we can use, instead of our right plane here, we can use our Flyout Feature Tree to select our top plane because I do want this plane here to be perpendicular to it. Then for my second reference, I'll choose one of those points and we'll also choose the point that's at the center of our polygon. So by selecting the appropriate references, we now have a fully defined plane. So I'll go ahead, click OK, and you can now see we have this other plane here as well. So what I'll do is this plane comes in Planes go out infinitely in any direction, so it doesn't really matter what size it is, but just for the sake of making it be almost the same as the other one, I'll just enhance the size a little bit. So now that we have our two reference planes, now we get to come to the fun part, where we're gonna actually design and shape what the profile of our pumpkin is going to look like. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select that right plane that we uh, originally had, and we're gonna start a new sketch on it. So I'll click sketch, and we're going to draw up, like I said, that profile. So we want our profile here to be a closed loop. So what I wanna do to start off with, right off the bat, even though this is a circular extrusion, so technically there's not an edge here, if I hover over it, you'll notice that I can click on it. That's technically because it's called a silhouette edge. So if I click on it, I can actually come up here and convert that over to this current sketch. Then the fun part is designing that form of what our pumpkin is going to look like from a side view. So for this, we're going to use our spline tool. So we'll grab our spline tool and splines are great for creating organic forms with interesting curvature. And they're basically defined by a series of points, which then SolidWorks goes in and uses equations to interpolate, interpolate the data between the curves to create your geometry. So what we're gonna do is zoom in a little bit and I'm going to add my first point here at the end of that vertical line. When working with splines, sometimes less is more because it's just easier to control when you have less points to manage. So we'll start off at that top point. We'll click another one down here. Let's put one towards the center here. I'll use my blue inference lines. We'll create one more down here towards the bottom and we'll continue back to the end of that line that we created. So once you're done, you just wanna hit escape on your keyboard and it ends that spline tool. So now you can see that we have a closed loop. Our sketch holds water. What I like to do is just make sure that that point is coincident with the bottom. 
you'll notice that I can just drag and just make sure that it is connected to that top and bottom edge. Then when we have our spline drawn, once you click on these points here, it activates something called your spline handles. And your spline handles allow you to manipulate what your spline looks like. So by dragging on different areas of your spline handle, there's a directional handle, a magnitude handle, and a combination at the end. So if you, I like to click on the one at the very end because you can control both the direction and the magnitude, or you can use one or the other. So once you kind of get the shape that you like, you can also move the points. There's also another way to control splines, something called your control polygon. If you're interested in learning more about these skills of using um, splines, definitely check out our advanced part class. Once we get the overall shape of our pumpkin um, profile down, what we want to do is go in and add some dimensions. I'm also going to add, though, a center line. I'm going to add a center line that goes from this point here, and if I hover over this vertical line, I can wake up that midpoint. And I want to make sure that it grabs that horizontal relation. The reason that I'm doing this is because when I add these dimensions in, when I go to create a different size pumpkin, I want it to update so that this point always stays at the center of my pumpkin. That way we kind of get this uniform, nice shape. You don't have to do this, but it's just kind of nice way to control it down the, down the road. Once we get this in, we do want to add some dimensions. So I like to go in and add a dimension defining the height between this bottom point and that bottom edge, and then the same thing on the top. So we'll just add some basic dimensions so that again, when our pumpkin scales, these points of our spline and our sketch move as well. We can also define the total width of our pumpkin because you could add this as part of your configurations. Maybe instead of just making tall and short pumpkins, you wanna make maybe narrower or wider pumpkins as well. So once we get this established and our sketch looks pretty good, then what I wanna do also, we could add some more dimensions so we could define how far away it is from this vertical um, line here. And right now I'm not going through and changing these dimensional numbers. Of course, when you go ahead and create something like this, you would wanna define them more so, but right now they're set up okay. So you can see adding those few basic dimensions does define our sketch. So we're gonna exit our sketch now, and this is going to be our profile one. What I wanna do now though, is I wanna add another profile onto my plane one. And I want it to be basically the exact same sketch as the one that I just created. And I want it to update so that if I ever change one of these sketches, the other one changes too. So we're going to use something called a derived sketch. And derived sketches are really neat because basically what they do is they rely on that original sketch for the overall shape and size, but it doesn't have to be used in the same location or for the same usage. So to create a derived sketch, you have to do a series of steps in a specific order. What you wanna do is you wanna select in your feature tree, the sketch that you wanna copy, hit control on your keyboard and select the plane that you want to push that or make a copy of that sketch to. So I wanna select that other reference plane we made, plane one. So with both of these two selected, I can come up here to insert and come down to derived sketch. If you don't have the correct thing selected in your feature tree, it will not be able, you will not be able to click on derived sketch. It'll actually be grayed out. But because we have the appropriate selections made, we can select it. Once you click on it, you'll notice that it actually made a copy of that sketch and placed it on that plane I had selected. If we look at it, you can see that it is underdefined 
And that's because, again, derived sketches do not um, have a position already set up, but it does have the exact same geometry. You'll notice that no dimensions come up. That's because it's being referenced from the original. So what I want to do now is I want to position and fully define where I want this to be located. So I'm going to come down here and grab this point here. And I'm going to select on this edge here and hit control. So when I do so, I want to pierce this. We do have coincident and pierce. Coincident and pierce are a little bit different. Pierce is basically a 3D coincident where you're taking that current point of the current sketch and you're placing it on a curve of another. So if we click pierce, you can see how that moves over. So now it's pierce at the bottom. However, our sketch is still underdefined. If I select this vertical line, you'll notice there is actually no vertical relation attached to it yet. So by just adding that vertical relation, that sketch now is fully defined and locked in place. So now if that original sketch ever changes, this one will, the changes will automatically propagate to this one as well. This is our second profile for our loft that we're gonna create. So I'll go ahead and exit out of that uh, sketch. So when we create a loft, it's going to go from this profile here and it's going to shoot straight across to this other profile. Well, if we look at a pumpkin, that outside is kind of curved, right? We have this nice curvature coming from this point to this point, right? So we want to add some guide curves in to control our loft as it goes from point A to point B. So let's do that now. So we'll create a couple more reference geometry, pieces of reference geometry. The first one I'm going to create is we're going to actually create it right up here on this top surface. So I can select any planar surface to create a new sketch. And I'm going to actually hide those two planes that we have just because it makes it a little bit easier to see. So basically, I want to control the curvature on this end of my profile from this profile to this one. I'm going to select this top surface and just convert that over. I can even convert these sketches here as well because I want to just keep the piece that's going between my two profiles. So if I convert those two sketches over, I can use my trim tool to trim away the excess portions that I don't want. Make Keep in mind though, that I am going to keep trimmed entities as construction geometry. The reason for this is because when I slash through these portions of the sketch, it's just turning them into reference geometry. That way I don't lose any of the relations. Otherwise, this portion of my sketch here would become underdefined. But by leaving them construction geometry, it does stay fully defined. And now I just have this portion here, which will be one of our guide curves. I'll exit my sketch. And now I just wanna create one more. This other guide curve is going to control the shape that it takes on the outside of my loft. So for this one, I actually wanna place it on a plane that's kind of centered, but parallel to this top plane. A neat shortcut is that if you click on a plane and you can see it in your graphics area, if you hold control on your keyboard and drag, you can quickly create a new reference plane without going up to features, reference geometry, and so forth. So now I can tell it that I want it to be parallel to my top plane, but I also want it to be coincident with this portion of the sketch that I already have. I'm making it coincident with the center line because remember, we made that at the very center of our um, pumpkin. So I'll click OK. And now I'll use plane two to create our last and final guide curve. I'll click sketch. And for this, I'm going to use a three point arc. So I'll click on my three point arc tool. And for a three point arc, I'm going to establish one side, then the other, and then determine that radius. So in this case, what we're gonna do is I can click on this point here and also this one here, and then I can determine how much I want that curve to be. 
So it doesn't really matter. Again, you kind of have that artistic license. What we can also do though, is if we click on this point here and we click on this curve, because we're going across 3D and in lofts, it is a good idea to go ahead and add that Pierce relationship to it. So again, you wanna select that point of your current sketch, hit control and select a curve in another one. The reason you wanna do this, so technically we could actually get rid of these coincidence. You can just hover over them, cl click on it and hit delete. The reason you wanna use a pierce is because as this travels along that curve, it's staying coincident with it, even if it changes. So that's what the pierce relation does. Then again, just good design is to go ahead and define this. Again, it really doesn't matter what the size is we'll make it have a radius of three inches. So now we're done with our second guide curve. So I can go ahead and exit out of this. So now we're ready to go in and create that loft. So we'll go to our feature tab and click on our loft boss base. So under our loft tool, what we wanna do is we wanna choose our profiles and choose our guide curves. If you have already had something selected, it does try to bring it in. We'll just delete it and add them manually. For our profiles, we'll select our two main sketches. With lofts, you do wanna select in kind of a similar location because it adds something called connectors between them. So I'll select on my profile here and I'll select on my other one as well. Notice if we look at it from a top view, it's just going straight across like the crow flies from point A to point B. So this is where we wanna add those guide curves in. So down here under guide curves, what we can do is we can select them from the graphics area or our flyout feature tree. So I'll select this one here and then I'll zoom out and we'll also select our other guide curve. Notice now as it travels, it's now following the path of that guide curve. If you look down here though, you wanna be careful. These are those connectors I was talking about. So it's trying to connect them, but it's following that outside curvature. So that's where this guide curve influence type comes up. And what we wanna do is we wanna go in and change this. You'll notice we have two next sharp, two next edge or global we wanna choose two next edge and you'll notice how it changes what it's doing between these two connectors. This extends that guide curve influence only to the next edge. There are also start and end constraints in this example. They're okay as is, they're both set to none. But what I do wanna check out, check out before we close and complete our loft is that I do wanna make sure merge results is checked on because my goal is that I want this body here to be merged with the central core. I'll go ahead, click OK, and you can see now we have almost like an orange slice. Well, it's actually a pumpkin slice, but now we have one single facet of our pumpkin. So all we need to do now is simply do a circular pattern. We'll come up to our feature tab, do a circular pattern, we wanna choose where our central axis is so we can choose on any circular edge or face. So for instance, here. And then we already did the math, right? Because we created that polygon in the beginning to tell it how many facets we want. So we know that 12 facets will perfectly fit going around our part. So I'll go ahead, click okay to accept this. And you can see now that very quickly we went from one slice to having a full pumpkin. So we're in pretty good shape here. So one major component is missing out of our pumpkin, right? We do want a stem. And so we're going to add a stem here up at the top. So I'm going to actually go back into my loft and find that sketch that I used as reference geometry, sketch five. I could have renamed these as well. I'm going to show this sketch because I'm actually going to reuse it right now because I wanna be able to connect to this center point. 
So for the stem, there's multiple ways you could go about creating this. You could use sweeps, you could lofts, but what we're going to do is we're going to create a sweep here and we're going to use 3D sketching. And so 3D sketching is pretty cool because it's very similar to 2D sketching, except you're not constrained to a single plane. You can switch between planes while you're, while you're sketching. So if you come over to your sketch tab and come over to sketch and hit the drop down, you can click on 3D sketch. So now I'm sketching in 3D. You can tell if you're in 3D because look at your feature tree. You'll notice how it says 3D sketch. So we're going to start by just drawing a simple line coming up. So notice it's very similar to regular 2D sketching, except notice next to my cursor how there's an XY next to it. That's an indicator of what plane I'm currently sketching on. If I click on this point, I can actually still make it coincident. When you're sketching in 3D, it does take a little bit of getting used to. It's a little bit tricky, but once you get a hang of it, it's super useful. If I come straight up, you'll notice that in my relations or in my property manager, you can see we can add relations like along X, along Y. And right now, if I sketch directly vertical, it's going to add an along Y relation. That's letting me know that this line is perfectly vertical. And then once we have this line drawn here like this, I'm going to actually switch to a spline tool because I want our spline again, or our stem to have this kind of swoopy geometry. So if we grab, grab our spline tool, remember we're still in that 3D sketch, I can make it coincident with that end of the line we just made. If I drag out inside of a 3D sketch, you'll notice we get these yellow dotted lines that go around. This basically is kind of showing me a preview of what plane I'm drawing on. It also says I'm on that XY plane, which is also known as our front plane. So we can draw it over here at an angle and click to add that point. If you want to switch what plane you're drawing on, so if we want to move from the front plane, for instance, to the right plane, you want to hit tab on your keyboard. Notice what happens to the, to the um, letters that are next to my cursor. It changes to YZ. So if you just keep hitting tab, it'll change what plane you're on. And again, that yellow dotted line kind of shows you what plane you're on. So then you'll go in and kind of sketch where you want this to be. We'll click to add that YZ point, and then let's switch back. Maybe we want to go to that top plane. So we'll go to the ZX axis. So we'll come over here and we'll add another point. And again, you can just kind of go around and play around with 3D sketching. I recommend trying to like create uh, just using lines to start off with. Splines are kind of unruly already. So practice with some lines first. Try to make a cube or something. And then once we're done here, I can just hit escape to exit out of it. If you rotate around, you'll see kind of the form that we made by sketching in 3D. So now that we have our basic form down, we can go in and add some basic dimensions. Another tip for 3D sketching is I could have drawn a, just like a normal sketch on my 2D planes, reference geometry, and then added my points to be coincident with it. So there's different techniques that you can use. We do want our spline here to be tangent with this vertical line. So I'll grab that spline handle, kind of make it um, vertical or tangent with that, that vertical line, hit control and select the spline and that vertical. That way I can add that tangency between them. Then what I wanna do is I do wanna add some dimensions. I'm going to dimension each of these points from this top face. The reason I'm dimensioning all these points from this top face is because like I mentioned earlier in this, in this lesson here, is that the, this face here is going to change when we make different configurations. So by dimensioning it off of this top face, 
these points, the dimension is automatically going to adjust to follow wherever this that face sits. So you could go in and add more dimensions as well. For now, this is okay. So once we add all of those dimensions to those points, we can go ahead and exit our sketch. So with our 3D sketch here, if we want to create a sweep, we can go to our feature tab, click swept boss base. We can actually use something called a circular profile. If you if your a sweep requires a profile and a path. If your profile is circular, you actually don't need to create a separate sketch for it. You can just click circular profile. Then you can just determine what your diameter is, and then it'll go ahead and use a path that you select. So we can go ahead, click OK, and very quickly we created the sweep that has some very unique geometry. Again, another way we could have done this is that we could have created a loft, so maybe that this end profile would have been narrower or a smaller diameter. And you can go kind of get in and you know create different different types of stems and use different tools. There is no correct way. So now that we have our pumpkin, it's looking pretty good. What we can do is we can create configurations of it. So configurations are found on this tab here next to our feature tree. If you click here, by default, we always have a single configuration. But if we want, we can add more by right clicking on our part and clicking add configuration. So maybe we'll call this one our short because this is going to be our short pumpkin. I'll click OK. And so now our short configuration is active. I can just double click to switch between the two. Obviously, we haven't made any changes though, so that's why nothing changed. So if we wanna make this pumpkin to be the short version, I wanna make sure that I'm on that configuration. We'll switch back to our feature tree, and I'm going to double click on that boss extrude one. So that's that dimension I was talking about earlier that we're going to come back to. If I right click on that dimension, I can click on configure dimension. If I do so, it brings up this little chart here. And you can see that that dimension is right now 15 for both configurations. I can come in here and type in 12 inches. Maybe we want a 12 inch pumpkin instead. And I can click OK. If you want to bring up this chart again, make sure you do give it a name. Otherwise, this same chart won't be available but that configuration will stick. So right now we don't need to save our chart, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click OK. So as you can see now, our pumpkin changed size. So that dimension now is 12 inches instead of 15. So if we go back over to our configuration manager, if I switch between them, you'll see how my pumpkin gets larger and smaller just by switching what configuration I'm in. So what's nice about this is I can make an assembly using all of the same part file and just switch what configuration each part is. And I can create, like I mentioned, a little pumpkin patch with all these different pumpkins. Of course, we would wanna probably go in and change the colors of it, make it not gray. But for now, this, is, this looks pretty good and so that's how we'd create a pumpkin in SOLIDWORKS. Does anybody have any questions or anything that they would like me to go over? I do see we have a couple questions in the chat. So it would it work differently using a coincident relation versus peers? And then Dan had a question about that same coincident relation. So if it would work differently in this particular instance, coincident would have been fine. It would rebuild the same way because they are actually touching each other. Um, if you use Pierce as it travels, if you look at it from a different angle, it might not be at the exact same point. 
So that's where that Pierce relation comes in handy because it's following that point across a curve, not where the two touch in space. So you could, I could have left that coincident relation because it wasn't overdefining it and it wasn't preventing it from um, completing the loft. So it would have been fine either way, but it is good to know what that Pierce relation does. So good questions. Sure, so Josh asked how to put the different configurations into an assembly file. So once we made this, we do wanna make sure that we save this out. So we'll save this just as pumpkin, right? Go ahead, replace it. And so we'll go ahead and make an assembly of it. So we'll make an assembly from our part, click OK. And then we'll go in and we'll add our pumpkin in, right? So here's pumpkin one. If we go to assembly, we can insert another one and let's add another pumpkin, right? So we'll place another pumpkin over here. So right now they're both the same configuration. They're set up as that short configuration. If I single click on one of my pumpkins, right, in my feature tree, notice this window pops up. And right now it's saying, well, hey, you're on the short config. I can just hit the drop down and switch which configuration I want to use and click the green checkbox. So now, even though it's the same part file, it's showing that other pumpkin in the other configuration. So if you had way more configurations, you could add all of them to the same assembly file. This is super useful. For instance, let's say you have a pin on a part or in an assembly and your company uses multiple size pins. Well, you can create just one part file, make a different configuration for the different lengths of it, and then use that same part file in multiple assemblies and just choose which size you want. So very, very useful. So great questions. And so Jacob had a good question. So if you could you have repeated the sketches 360 around and connected the loft back to itself. So So let me go back to my part file here. So you're sa saying that if we just had that first loft here could I have repeated the sketch 360 around and gone all the way around? If we had went all the way around, it would have created this shape, but it would have been our entire pumpkin. It wouldn't have created those nice little facets and it would have just been one big shape rather than having these different ribs per se. So again, there's other ways that you could have created this pumpkin. This is just one way to do it with relatively few amount of features. So a lot of this content that I covered is in our essentials class and our advanced modeling class. So if that's something you'd be interested in, uh, please check out our website. We do have our training schedule up. If there's no other questions, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for taking your time and your lunch break to join me today to create a pumpkin and salad works and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving.